Hope is one of those words that has lost its meaning over time. Just like love, maybe even just like faith. Hope is something that has turned into wishful thinking. I hope the Cubs turn things around before the end of the year, or I hope that um, I win the lottery next week, or whatever it is that you are hoping for, we tend to think, well, good luck, right? But that's not what biblical hope is really all about. And when we as Christians think about hope, it is a certainty. It is thinking about things that will happen, but have not happened yet. For instance, I hope the sun rises tomorrow, and it will. I have hope that we have a nice cold winter, and we will. <laughs> These are things that are pretty much given. They haven't happened yet, but it's going to happen. And the greatest hope that we have as Christians is that this world is not it. And this is what I want us to be focusing our hearts and our thoughts on today. We do celebrate our country. Our country is only 200 years old. Maybe 250, right? We're getting there, depending on how you count and when things actually started. However, on average, a country lasts somewhere between three and four hundred years. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we are not going to be divided in heaven by our various races, by the color of our skin, by what party you happen to belong to, or which country you ever lived in. There are two things that separate. One, did you live? And two, did you live in Christ? If you have lived and you have lived in Christ, then you will be in heaven. If you have not lived, you won't. If you have lived but you have lived outside of Christ, there's actually another place for you. This is the harsh reality. Last week, I shared with you a verse, and I'm going to share it with you again. It's 1 Corinthians 1.18, and I think it's a great launching pad for sermons. And last week, I used it to talk about how we need to share our faith. I, I focused on the message of the cross. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And today I want to talk about how faith has consequences. And if our faith is in the right place, then we are being saved. And if you're being saved, it's not by our own righteousness, but by the power of God. You see, we are in the midst of a clash of worldviews, and we're beginning to see that more and more. It used to be that we were a predominantly Christian culture. And even if people didn't necessarily personally know the Lord, we as Christians were able to influence culture to the point where, well, they respected us. And they wouldn't curse in front of us if we asked them not to. They would live with integrity because they respected the law. Well, nowadays, every man is doing whatever he wants. And in fact, Christians are reflecting the world culture more than we are reflecting Jesus Christ. So the consequences of such faith, and it is a faith, to believe that we are the random result of a universe that is impersonal, if we believe that we have just been spat out of the gene pool, and if we believe that there is no consequence whether we live or die, that doesn't fill us with hope, that fills us with despair. 
And that's what we're experiencing right now. Despair. Suicide is at levels that we have never seen before, ever. Drug abuse and drug addiction, drug overdoses, are now the norm, whereas it used to be unheard of. People are trying to cope with a worldview which is faulty. And it's one thing to say, yeah, it's wrong, it's not true, but it's not even helpful. I don't understand why people would even want to embrace that, except that they are in rebellion against God, and they refuse to bow down before him, and they would rather die than repent. They would rather die than change. You see, this same problem that I'm talking about now existed back in the first century. And when the Apostle says that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, what he means is it makes no sense to them. They're blinded. They cannot tell the difference between truth and error. For them, it's true that the cross is foolishness. But to us who are being saved, the cross is not foolishness at all. The cross is the power of God. There were differences even in the way people viewed themselves back then, and we were still influenced by that. The Greeks, for instance, they believed that the material world was evil and the spiritual world was holy. And it was foolish to think that Jesus Christ is risen because that would require his material body to be alive again, redeemed, glorified. And for the Greek mind, that was impossible. What they would have rather heard was that Jesus Christ died and became a whiskey spirit. But that's not the gospel, is it? No, the gospel is that Jesus Christ rose from the dead mind, body, and spirit. And if he is risen, we will too. You see, God is interested in total redemption. He wants us to, beginning now, to become transformed into the likeness of Christ. And that happens for us, just like as it did with Christ, in the mind, in the spirit, and in the body. Now, it's true, our bodies are becoming decrepit. We get older, we get sick, and we do die. However, as our minds are transformed, our habits begin to change. And there may be some destructive behaviors in your life, for instance, that you gave up. Perhaps it was excessive drinking or smoking or something else. And as a result, your body has become to rejuvenate. You've gotten healthier because of it. Well, there's a transformation that's occurring. It's not complete yet. It won't be complete until the day of the Lord. But beginning now, we are becoming transformed into the likeness of Christ. And it starts from the inside out. If we are going to have hope in this life, a real, certain hope, it has to be based on something. For us Christians, it is not based upon our ability to believe. I'll bet that surprises some of you. No, the hope that we have is actually found in the promises and in the character of God. 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4 says, His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us the exceedingly great and precious promises. When it talks about knowledge, knowledge of God, knowing him, it's not saying knowing about him, being able to memorize his attributes, but instead actually experiencing God. And I did a whole series on experiencing God. That has to do with our walk with him on a regular basis. Hearing what his word says, trusting that it's true, and then acting upon it. And then giving God glory when you actually see him working in your life. That's experiencing God. As we do that, we begin to not only know about his promises, they become true in our lives. 
So what has God in fact promised us? Well, there are a number of things, and I don't know that I've got a complete list here. But these are some promises from God that work in my life and cause me to have a certain hope. The first promise is redemption. Redemption is another one of those words that we forget what it actually means. But let's look at the verse first. For it's 2 Corinthians 5, verses 2 and 5. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. So as we are on this earth, we're groaning. We want to be in heaven. We want our new bodies. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given us the Spirit as a guarantee. The other Bible says a deposit. So when I think of redemption, I remember what it was like for a little boy, me, when I was young. And I would go around trying to gather glass bottles. You remember those? Glass bottles that were had a redemption value of five cents or ten cents. And nowadays you can still see uh, in Michigan and California they're worth five cents. I wonder how many of those actually get redeemed there. I don't know. But God has actually put a redemption value on the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has been given to us. So that when we die... And when all of these promises are being fulfilled in God, we who have the Holy Spirit are going to be able to trade him in for all the promises that he's made for us. Does that make sense? It worked for me. You see, there's a tension that goes on in, in my heart. It's this now, not yet kind of tension. I've been saved, but I'm going to be saved. I'm saved from the penalty of sin, and yet I keep on sinning, and then I have to bear the consequences of it. I'm free from its power, so that I, I don't have to sin anymore, and yet I keep on sinning. Well, what's up with that? I must love the sin more than I love my Lord. But someday, I am going to be free from its presence. And I am not even going to want to sin anymore. Do I get an amen out of that? Amen! I think that's just an amazing thing. You know, the day is coming when we are going to be free from all of the effects of sin. That is what makes me groan, is that it's still here. And it's not just my sin. It's my family's sin. It's my friend's sin. It's the sin in this nation. It's the sin all over this world. It's the abortions that are happening everywhere. And the, and the, the, the human trafficking. And the, the people overdosing on drugs and killing themselves. All of that stuff just makes me groan. It just wanted me to get out of here. And someday I will. And someday you will too. You see, if we really do believe the promises of God, we will have confidence in them. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 and through 8 says, So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, the confidence that I have is in the promise of God, that if I'm dead, I'm in God's presence. How that actually works, I don't know. I have not been there yet, so I can't tell you. And you haven't either. We need to be placing our faith and our confidence in what the scriptures actually tell us and not what pop culture might want to tell us. And I know there have been lots of stories written in the last few years based upon people's experience about going to heaven and coming back. Those may or may not be true. I don't know. I will tell you this. From a person's experience, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But as I said earlier, that is not the gospel in its entirety. If that was true, then Jesus Christ had no reason to rise from the dead. 
he would just be a whiskey spirit now. But no, Jesus Christ is risen. Instead, the way I would approach this verse is to say that, you know, I, I, uh, I trust in God. Like I trust in a roller coaster down at Six Flags. <laughs> that roller coaster might whip me around. It might make me do some corkscrews. And usually, ultimately, what happens is you end up going up a hill. Click, 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 click. And then you reach the top, and you look down, and you think you're going to die. And then you do, right? You slide down at such a rate. And if you're buckled in, and you're holding on tight, you're going to be safe. Actually, if you're buckled in, you're going to be safe. Because I've seen people, they go around down like this, right? They're not holding on. They've got completely, complete trust in that car to hold them on the track. As a hospice chapel, and I've seen that too. I've seen people enter into God's presence like this. <laughs> but I've seen people holding on white knuckled, scared to death all the way down until they finally breathe their last. But the fact is, just as a car never leaves the track, you can trust that Jesus never lost a passenger. He will bring you safely through that's confidence, and that's something that we can hold on to. Now, I'd like to talk about the resurrection just a little bit, because this is the gospel. The gospel is not that we will become wispy spirits. The ultimate end is that we are going to be reunited with ourselves. We are going to be new creatures. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. We often talk about the rapture, assuming that we are going to somehow still be alive when Christ comes back. And people have been believing that for 2,000 years. It may happen at any time. But I think if we are in Christ, the odds are definitely in our favor that we are going to experience that event not as a rapture, but as a resurrection. And that resurrection will come. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 42 through 44, we learn about the resurrection. The resurrection of the dead is so, and the so has to do with the seed. Some of us are gardeners. We plant the seed in the ground, and the seed breaks open and begins to grow something that looks completely different from the seed. And that's the analogy that is given. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. See, the confidence that I have here is that God is going to find you. It doesn't matter if your body is well preserved in a coffin somewhere, or if you had yourself burned and put into an urn, or if some shark destroyed you, or a python, or a lion. God is going to be able to find you. His power is great enough that he will be able to raise up your body incorruptible. And when he does, that's not the end. I'd like to share with you just a little bit that's going to happen. Because God's not done with us even after he's raised us from the dead. He's got a job for you and me to do. And some of us may be feeling more up to this than others. But here it is. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm going to begin with verse 6, just because it wouldn't all fit on the slide. But it's going to be 6 through 9. The apostle says, These, these are the ones that rebelled against God, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, 
Whoops. I'm in the wrong verse. Sorry, verse 6. It is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. You've heard the verse, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. God will give to you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So what does that have to do with you? Well, I think we're going to be there. We're going to be executing judgment on those who rebelled against God, too. I'd like to uh, have you read the psalm that we read earlier this morning with that in view. Psalm 149, verses 5 through 9. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. And I, I'm thinking of that as even their deathbed. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the written judgment. This honor have all his saints. Praise the Lord. So someday you will be a warrior. We will come with him, with his mighty hosts. That's not the only passage that says that, but I found it interesting to see right there in the psalm that we read this morning. When all that is done, there is going to be a time of reward. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10 says, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in their body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. The scriptures talk about crowns that will be given to those who are in Christ. There is a crown of life that is given to us. There is a crown of glory. And there is a crown of righteousness. And then the apostle says that there is a crown that is those that we win for Christ. So you also, if you have led somebody to the Lord, will receive a crown with that person's name on it. I think that's kind of cool. So what are we supposed to do with all of these promises? So I would say, first of all, we need to hope. We need to make that decision that we are not going to despair. We are going to place our hope. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And then Hebrews 6.19 says, This hope we have as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence of the veil, behind the veil. And then also we need to prepare for the day. Because... We need to become holy. In Hebrews 12, 4, which I don't have here, it says that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Hebrews 10, 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. So we need to prepare. We need to prepare for the day of Jesus to come. I'm reminded of the virgin of the, the ten virgins parable, where the, they were waiting and waiting and waiting. And some of the virgins were ready for the bridegroom to come. Some of them were not. The ones who were not ready, even though they were waiting, when the time came, they ended up left out. We certainly don't want to be that way. We want to be like those who are ready. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I thank you that we have the Holy Spirit as a deposit for the day of redemption. And I thank you, O oh Lord, for all of the goodness that you give to us in your word. I do pray that you would help our hope to be steadfast and secure, even in the midst of turmoil. And help us, O oh Lord, to live a holy life 
to prepare for the day when we do come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.